Hey, it's Chris. You ready? It's been almost a month or so since I did the last crowdfunding roundup. So we are back here. First full week into January. What do you need to know? What's launched? Where are things at? Covering it all as much as I can, as usual, in the shortest amount of time with the most amount of information. You ready to go? It's been a long time. Hammer barn out. Let's do this. So we'll start with the biggest one first. The Dice Tower raising $200,000 right now at the time of me filming this. It's, you know, got almost uh, three and a half weeks to go. Uh, the first thing I'll say is I really like the fact that they always go with, uh, I'm assuming, I'm assuming a true funding goal. Now, is this the true funding goal? Is it, you know, they've got some stretch goals down there as well. The one thing that's stood out to me the most is that I think, and maybe this is, again, it's a marketing thing. It's also a expansion thing. It's a, a little bit of uh, expanding horizons, I guess is really what I'm trying to say is that in case you weren't aware, they're starting to do some more RPG stuff. And I think that's them recognizing the untapped potential of the RPG side of things because the RPG aspect of the tabletop scene is much larger, much larger than the board game scene, folks. Uh, you may not want to hear that, but it's totally and utterly true. I mean, just look at D&D, anything that's online with a really good solid product, right? Massive, just like the video game side of things dwarfs board games. It's same here true. And so some of their stretch goals are related to expanding some of that content. So you're hearing it here for first. I would not be surprised if, um, you know, in a year or two, they're doing a ton more. Maybe not. But, you know, you also got to stick true with uh, what got you there in the first place. But, you know, the price is slightly higher, I think. Well, no, I guess I you know I had to look it up there in the edited section. Uh, 2022's was only $50 to get the, one of the promo packs. 2023's was also $60, just like it is $60 this year. And, you know, they basically just say, that's what you get for supporting us. $5 a month, over 12 months. There you go. I, I'm not going to say value-wise, good, bad, or the other, right? Uh, I'll leave that up to you to decide uh, how you feel about that. Because a lot of people love them and love the stuff they put out. So it is what it is. And if that's the price you're willing to pay, it's the price you're willing to pay. Here are the stretch goals that I mentioned. And I wouldn't be surprised if they hit them all. Now, the thing I will say, and this is the thing that always grinds my gears about most of these uh, campaign fundraisers, you know, whatever it may be is that when you get down to the actual boxes of uh, promos, right? Because that's essentially what a lot of people are getting from all of these sponsors, is that I really hate the fact that they separate out the ones that are most desirable because there never is a rhyme or a reason between these. Um, they say right here, we can't offer promos separately. We can't allow you to pick it. And so I understand it at the same time it's not like there's necessarily a theme that this is called the Adam pack. Well, Adam, just a random name, essentially, is what it looks like to me. And it seems like some of the high demand ones just get separated out to make you or to entice you to buy them separately. And inevitably, I see tons of these end up being sold in the secondary market where you have these people that are like, I wanted these two promos. And again, you guys are gonna let me know in the comment section that, Chris, I don't buy them for the promos. I do this as a support. And then uh, whatever promos out of that pack that I like, I take as a bonus on top of it. And you know what? I won't argue with that. That's not a bad point. It's not an issue, but it's also a ton of money for what it is. And so again, as someone who has limited income, limited funds, is this the best use of those from your aspect of things? No, no judgment there. That's an honest, question that I would ask you to ask. And so if it is great, fantastic, awesome, you're going to get a whole bunch of new stuff as well here. A lot of this is the newest of the new uh, within the last year or two, uh, you know, especially this one, right? I mean, look at this, uh, you know, Clank just put out something new, White Castle new, Kingfire Chronicles new, Among Cultists new, Dice Manor new, Disney Sources Arena, a little older, still have a couple of expansions, uh, Scarface new, To Glory with the expansion new, Dreadful Meadows new, Art Society just out, Core Quest a little bit older, Garden Guest literally uh, just covered that uh, a month ago, Last Light just released, Thunder Road Vendetta new, like all, you know, so they're definitely hitting on the hotness there from that aspect of things. And it's, it's very similar. I mean, you have uh, promo content here for games that aren't even out yet as well. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, Creature Caravan here, uh, Aeon Trespass Odyssey. Um, you know, some of these are a little older, but not terribly <laughs> much older. Uh, well, we're getting down to a few older ones down here. Ooh, Summoner Wars. Uh, but, you know, that's sort of what you're getting. Hegemony, Dragon Eclipse promo. That's not even anywhere close to being. So, you know, and then you can flip a coin. Are you going to get Dragon Eclipse first or are you going to get the promo first? <laughs> teasing 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 but um that's what you have to say i mean th there's nothing else if you want some of those higher levels those higher levels of playing games with them or eating breakfast with them at a convention or something like that those always go and those are always hot and people love those so you just need to figure out whether or not you want this and go for it if you do and if you don't that's okay too so 
there's other ways to support people as well. You choose what's right for you. And that is what we're covering first up this week. Then we're going over to my pick of the week, and this is Explorers of Navoria uh, from Dronda. Dronda's importing this game, and I really wanted to cover this one. I won't lie to you guys. I really, really had uh, my eyes set on this one. I even covered it as the quarter one, one of the hotter ones in quarter one that I was excited about. But what is it bringing to the table as an import game? It's already over four times its funding goal, which is great. Um, you know, I sort of uh, looked at this page and I wasn't sure what to expect whatsoever. But essentially what it's got, it's got a four-phase system of a combo pseudo worker placement tableau building uh, resource management ask card driven game and now that sounds like a lot but when i actually run you through the mechanisms real quick you'll understand so essentially what you're doing is you're bag pulling it is the first phase of the game what you're doing is you're pulling two tokens from a bag or one from the board in order to then use that token to match one of the corresponding decks and from that deck there will be a certain amount of cards that are face up along the side you then take one of those cards in a drafting manner and put it in your tableau and it may have immediate effects or it may have effects in the next phase of things and you do that for a total of potentially three to four times depending on the player count so you're going to build this tableau and you do this over three rounds so if you're playing with anything less than four players you're going to end up with 12 cards by the end of the game and these are going to be synergistic but they're also going to be combo driven and just cumulative and so what you're doing i think there's five different types of these cards you know soldiers explorers farmers and one or two others that i'm blanking on but they're all different color coded and you move your characters and as you gather these characters they're also going to be moving you along these exploration tracks which are going to get you other further bonuses but that other token if you take uh the token from the bag at the beginning of the round you place the other one down on the board now you can choose to grab two randomly from the bag as your turn and then choose one of those two or you can take one of the ones that someone else has already set down on the board and know which one you're getting then in that sense but as you're placing those down then on the decks in the third phase, which we'll talk about in a second, you actually pull them back up because the second phase is going to be basically, I believe, if I'm not getting these out of order, gathering the resources that some of these workers or these cards are going to provide you as your sort of income phase. And then the next phase of things along with that is going to get you more resources because you are then pulling them off of some of these spots in order to gather certain resources based on which spots you're pulling them from, which is going to correspond to where people put them down in the first place. But that phase of things you actually do in reverse turn order. So so at the beginning, you're going to have the necessarily pulling from the bag first, but then the person who goes last is going to be able to reverse pull and get more of the resources they want sooner if there are some limited aspects of that. Expansion that they're offering here is going to give you a fifth player ability. They're also offering a few deluxifications in terms of upgraded components and a playmat down below that we'll talk about in a second. The thing I wasn't quite sure of, uh, they talk about here, if we scroll down to the expansion, uh, the expansion box, expansion rule book, great cards, whatever, new location, which is a new different location that you can be placing some of these resources down or gathering them up from. And then asymmetric setup tiles and asymmetric player power tiles. So that makes me think that it's going to give uh, the asymmetry that may not be there in the base game. And if you're like me, you do like an inkling of asymmetry to go along with this. Is it going to be too asymmetric? How do you balance those things? I mean, that's always the concern because then it becomes a little bit less strategic and a little bit more tactical. How do you fall? Where do you fall on your thoughts on that side of things? And the price point is, let's go down here for a second. The Wanderer Pledge is $45 with the base game alone. The Explorer Pledge here for $59 gets you the expansion with the fifth player stuff and the new six elements available to you. Now, the other thing that I will be talking about either shortly before this video or shortly after this video is that they went with a tactic that I'm not sure how I feel about yet. In this one, it's not really as big of a deal, but they basically said, if you sign up for whatever on our website and you put $1 down before the campaign, you're gonna get an exclusive that's gonna cost you less than what it would during the campaign. Now, in, in most of these cases that I've seen, it's gonna be offered to everybody during the campaign, but like you put the $1 down and you, get the item that may have cost you say ten dollars in this campaign in the first place how do you feel about that that's a whole another rant video that i'm going to break that down and tell you my feelings on it and, and let me tell you it's spicy but it's a great video if you haven't seen it or if it hasn't come out yet one of the two but uh, all the big people are covering this as well uh and they seem to like it so i'm really intrigued by this one this one you know, like I said, I really wanted to cover this one for my channel to have some hands-on thought myself. Solar Storm, Solar Sphere, Isle of Trains, you know, th those are all very appealing games to me in the first place. And so, uh, you know, this is right up that ilk for me. And some stretch goals here with some of the social media side of things, a bunch of quotes, a bunch of quotes, a bunch of explanation. They give you a little bit of the add-ons here, as we mentioned earlier there. The playmat actually looks really enticing as well. 
and the upgraded deluxe resources. So how to play, they run you through the phases that I just said, they've got the rule book on here. That's why I was able to talk to you about it in the first place. And there's plenty of video content. Wow. And I'm a sucker, you know me, for import games as a whole. And you can get some of their other ones that I just previously mentioned. I didn't actually scroll down this far, so I didn't know they were doing that. But take that for what it is. Now, the, you know, shipping is going to be an extra $10. This is going to be small indie publisher getting an import game that you're not going to get elsewhere. I don't know if this one would come to retail. I, I don't. And I'm intrigued to see, but that's the price point that you're going to pay for right now if you're really interested in it in the first place. So the thing I did not see on this page, though, and maybe I skipped over it, was that little thing I mentioned because it was uh, from their website initially. And uh, I know it was like a newsletter thing. And so I don't see it covered here, which is interesting. But uh, maybe I'll dig into that a little bit later and I can tell you uh, further information about that. Now, one last thing. This is becoming a topic not only on the Board Game Geek, but it was over on Reddit. There is some accusation that there is derivative art going on, quote, end quote. This is a blatant just ripoff of Kyle Farron's art from Root. Now, this is a weird conversation, right? Because from an IP standpoint, several lawyers have weighed in. Not me. I'm just reporting the news, folks. That you can't really intellectually copyright art. Isn't that the whole AI thing? But anyway, I digress. The issue being, it's very similar. It's mimicking it to ride its coattails, essentially, right? Well, I mean, if the game doesn't hold up, who cares what it looks like at the same time? And if you're someone that's going to fall for imitation art, well, hmm, bad news for you there. But there are also comments on the forum section. Here are the images, the layers of these images to show you that this is still unique art. I don't know if people are white knighting this or if it's really a big deal. I mean, this is outside of my jurisdiction. However, you know, the one thing I didn't see yet at this point, at least, right, is, you know, anyone from Leader or Kyle Farron saying anything as well. There's also the opposite end of the spectrum saying, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I don't know where it falls in the spectrum of everything from this is the most worst awful thing I've ever seen in a board game, people shouting it in the forum sections versus saying, hey, it's no big deal, copy, copy imitation flattery as well. How big of a deal is it to you if art is similar between games, if you get inspiration from one, right? Because we've seen it with mechanisms all the time, Kingdom Death Monster, Aeon Trespass Odyssey, uh, from a mechanistic standpoint, how many clones of Dominion and Magic the Gathering are there out there? So from that aspect, I don't really know what to make of this, but people are making it an issue, I guess. Now, next up, we're going to go with The Last Lighthouse. And they, they sent out an email. I'm actually on their uh, reviewer email uh, that they send out before these campaigns to say, hey, do you want to cover this? Uh, either the retail ones or the crowdfunding ones. And I saw this one, and this intrigued me very much so. But I ended up, again, like too busy. And this one is a solo only game. This is The Last Lighthouse, a Scott Alms game. And this looks actually relatively fantastic. And I, again, I really like the aesthetic. Not that that really matters as a whole, but you know you're going to be getting a good deal from their games. You got essentially what you've got here going on is you've got Lighthouse. And you're defending this Lighthouse from the great old ones, you know, Cthulhu esque nightmares that they're calling it here. And on one side, you have, uh, you know, the actual nightmares, and then you have your traps on the other side. And your traps are going to say, or tableau system knock out the nightmares, but then the nightmares are going to attack the traps. And you're essentially trying to make it all the way through the deck. And as you capture the nightmares and knock the nightmares out, they become, they become traps into your hand, which then you can use to subsequently knock out more nightmares because you're putting out a nightmare every single turn in order to achieve or overcome its value in the first place. As always with their games, you get a mini expansion to go along with it. And again, the only reason I didn't do this was because I'm just not very good at solo games as a whole covering them on my channel you know s let me clarify that i am not good at covering simply only solo games you know games that have solo modes sure games that are only solo it's not my forte and i would really like to actually try this one out but i said no because i, I can't just do that for everything on this channel i'm just 
one man and don't have enough time but they offer a whole bunch of their other products, which is always a sort of a question and conundrum for me. When I see this $110,000 funded, it always makes me go, how much of this is the product itself and how much of this is like the back catalog? Because also their back catalog isn't always available or it's sometimes sold out on the website. So it's just a thought, you know, question experiment that I have going on in the, my head as a weird League of Games sort of thing, right? If you've watched my channel at all, you know that happens all the time. But there you go. It's killing it actually right now. Good job. You know what? Here, we'll talk about the second game up, and this one also has very high appeal to me. I might be backing this as soon as I finish filming this, and this is called Aqua. And in case you're not familiar, uh, Kickstarter does this like once a year where they do the make 100. So basically, these games only do, or these projects only do 100 copies. So this is Aqua. This is from an indie designer where it's a two-player, uh, not really tile, but it's a card placement, tile placement game, if you will, with a little bit of set collection bonus as you're scoring, because this is a two-player game where essentially all you're doing is you're putting these cards down in rows and columns, and you're making a grid, and you're scoring this grid at the end of the game once all the cards are down, but you only score these cards because as you fill these gaps, you can only put face-down cards next to face-up ones, or face-up ones next to face-down ones, but if the face-down ones are surrounded, then you get to flip it face-up to allow it to score potentially at the end of the game. How you score that is you go set collection wise rows and columns one person scores rows one person scores columns the tricky standpoint though with this 18 card game system is that you only score the row or the column if it's somewhere between 10 to 20 points if it's less than 10 you don't score it. if it's more than 20 you don't score it and did i mention they have a pocket edition as well color me intrigued do i like the aesthetic yeah it's nice i think it's different it's going to be something that's going to be, uh, you know, aesthetically pleasing to the table. It's giving a different value of eye candy. And you can see here how it can be arranged potentially as you go along. And you all can also score slightly differently or add value to some of the cards by moving a visitor token three spaces from the boat card that gets played and adding a victory point to the target card if it's scored. So it has to be like face up again, right? And that's it. You just go. You get lily pad bonuses based on consecutive rows that have at least one lily pad. And if you tie, well, you know what? You can get that and play it again because it's not going to take you that long to play in the first place. Uh, day one, you're past that. You're not going to be able to get this. $7, but the pocket one at $10. Or if you really want the full experience, it's just going to cost you 30 plus 12 shipping. So North America, at least. And I don't really think there's a whole lot of... Maybe this is just the Make 100 here, just this version of it. Uh, the signed version so maybe you can get all the other stuff unlimited but i like the glossy art prints i'm never going to buy them uh, i think the meal neoprene mat is nice but again unnecessary with just a card-based game i really like the idea of the pocket edition as a whole so i will probably be backing that as soon as i hang this up uh but it's by a designer who you may have remembered me covering previously their other games i know i covered fork and i know i covered boba Mujang. i don't actually remember kung pao chicken but anyway you can get a few of the other ones as well a uh, little bit of a review, a little bit of upgraded, just making it a little bit nicer. So indie publisher, indie design, you're not going to find this anywhere else, which is why I'm probably going to be a sucker for it and back it as soon as this video is over. Next up, uh, portable backgammon. I'm just going to leave it at that. It's portable backgammon. It's lightweight. You can take it anywhere. It's got $35,000. So people love their backgammon and it's built to go anywhere that you may want to go. See right there, beach, fire, or sand, whatever you want from that aspect of things. Two and a half pounds or so, as it says, and you just take it and go. I'm going to leave it at that. If you want backgammon, you like backgammon, check it out. If you don't, well, this one doesn't change your opinion either. Okay, then we're going over here. Bezier is back with a silver collection. Now, I was vaguely familiar with the silver games in general. I didn't know there were this many, but there are four, I believe, if I remember correctly now, that I looked at it earlier, in this general collection. If you're not familiar with the silver collection, like I previously was, and I was aware, but not actually mechanistically aware, this is basically golf. Now, they say they can make the comparison, like, you know, with their advanced werewolf games, which is just advanced mafia, right, with player asymmetric ability powers. Well, it's the same thing true here. You've got golf. If you're not familiar with golf as the card game, right, you have four cards down in front of you that are face down. And only in this game, you're going to be drawing and replacing your cards just similar to golf. But every card that you draw is potentially going to have a power. It's also going to have a number of wolves that that card attracts. Again, similar to golf, you're going to have a very, very similar, well, end game. You want to have the least number of points or wolves in this case but when you draw you have the option to replace one of your cards or you discard when you discard it often these cards will trigger their abilities or they're going to be passive abilities that are going to go along with you and the difference is is that each of these four games offer a slightly different experience as a whole but the reason that they are all under they say silver umbrella is that they can all be mixed and matched because they're all going to have different values a la your regular 52 card deck 
And with that, what you do if you want to swap one in, one out from a different set is you just take all of that number, all of the number ones, all of the number 13s, all of the number fives, and you swap them all in from one and you swap them all out from the previous one. Rinse and repeat. Now, the exclusive they say here, if you go over to the FAQ, they lay it out very, very explicitly, which is, which is kind of nice to be frank. What is exclusive? Well, the box, the promos, and the five to six player expansions with the neoprene mats. That is the stuff that isn't gonna show up elsewhere. So if you really want some of that stuff, you need to potentially get it here. The only question I have is, you know, with this, I don't know how much swapping you're going to want to do. I think you're going to find one or two of these game modes that are going to be better for you because they all have a little bit of a different game mode to go along with it. If I'm thinking of this correctly, because I believe like one of them, for example, has more of a team mode. So it's going to be pick your poison, pick your, well, silver, essentially, just, you know, literally in that sense. So that's all you're doing. And, you know, just like similar with golf, you call a vote and you think you have the least. And if you have the least, you win. And if you don't, though, you get an extra 10 points added to whatever your total is in the first place. And I think you play like four rounds or you play up to a certain point score. Anyway, you don't care about that aspect. But you care about the actual mechanisms. And then they allow you with these different chapters to have these different silver items that are going to give you different manipulation here. Amulet protecting your own villagers, the bullet allowing you to move but uh, remove it from scoring, the coin, flip over card, uh, down here, the silver fang, you can you get your own discard pile that only you can draw from because as you're discarding them, people can take them from the draw deck or the cards that have been discarded. So you play that super strong card, the super good ability, well, they can just grab it and discard it too. So that's what you're getting. Shelf access, I mean, I like this. This is a nice deluxification. I just worry about the practicality of it at the same time, right? It's a nice storage thing, but is it gonna be a nice, I can get it out and actually utilize it, or am I gonna have to like get it out and put it down on the table and then unfold it and then take up like half the table to even unfold it to get to the parts that I want? How easy am I gonna be able to swap in and out? And you can see that really it's, you know, from that side of things, storage for play mats. So as someone who's not gonna get the play mats, pass. All the rules are here. And the pledge level, I mean, it's fine for what it is. For the deluxe storification that you're getting and the game, you know, for a hundred dollars, okay, sure, you know, but here's six of them. I didn't realize there were six actually. Never mind about my four comment earlier. And the collector's edition cards, they're slowly unrevealing, you know, the 12 promo cards or whatever it is during this side of things. I don't really think a game like this is suitable as well for a playmat, but your mileage is going to vary. If you want to pretty up, they're going to give you plenty of chances to spend money on it. No add ons, no nothing else from that aspect of things and you're going to have it toward the end of the year. So this is a game that I would just love to buy one of these and just, you know, really dive deep into which one that I'm going to buy beforehand. So I'd love to like head to head compare these all when they come out and when I could look at them from that aspect of things. But right now, this is too much of a gamble for me to say, okay, how many of these I'm actually going to like and which one is it going to be? Because this is one that I just don't know. Like this is one where I look at the rules and I understand them, but the dynamic of how I'm actually going to play and which ones I'm actually going to like and which ones I'm going to want to swap off in and out that's my concern. It's like Marvel United expansions, if you will, right? Like, ideally, I like some of those characters. Do I actually like the mechanics when I play them? Not sure. That's why we're talking about it, though. And it's doing really well, actually, all things considered for a light card game. You know, 92,000 is very respectable. Next up, Omerta, the five families. This is an area control based on the mafioso, if you will. And this is bringing us a big four-phase situation where you're doing area control, bribing, uh, respect, honor, all of those things. Now, 72-hour early bird is going to be over by the time you're watching this. Gets you a little mini expansion. Uh, the core pledge level is going to be $50 in this game, but then the deluxified version with a bunch of plastic, colored plastic, mind you, not just gray, is going to cost you, what is it, like 99 if I'm remembering correctly? 95 Okay. So, essentially, this goes through four different phases where you're going to be slowly uh, gathering your resources, buying influence, bribing, even going into cahoots and increasing your alliance with other people, but also then buying your members and power and trying to control the different areas. But you're going to be doing it in you know a little bit of a different manner. Uh, I'm not sure I quite get some of the alliance stuff. Now, the, the tricky part is you can be anywhere along a spectrum of alliance with people. Like you can be allies, you can be friendly, you can be neutral, or you can be hostile, or you can be at war. And so depending on how you do that, you're going to have different opportunities, I think, to have different effects. And they say each round of this game is essentially two centuries worth of time. Two centuries. I'm leaving that in there. It is essentially two decades worth of time of the evolution 
in real life in that sense of what happened, the inventions, as you can see here, the Remington, the Gatling gun. So things that are going to allow you to have more interaction on the board, not only just battling, but just innovation wise as well with a being a better mafia, right? So that's kind of the gist of it. You're really going to have to read the rule book. It's not a huge rule book, but it's 25 pages or so. And it's really more detailed than I can go into from the four phases here. You see the plastic that I mentioned, and then it's the exclusive stuff. A little bit of upgrades right there. Again, the nice thing this week is all the rule books are on the pages. There's a little bit of content down here as we go, the how to play is the little videos, the little shipping. Uh, but you're really probably going to be best off reading this rule book because, again, as a not huge area control person, I'm not sure this is necessarily doing distinctly different stuff. And that's not a bad thing, right? Um, I'm not going to call it derivative. Oh, God, that term this week. So it's just different. Do you like this theme? Are you liking some of the bribing, some of the bidding that this has? For example, in one of the phases, you have to bid to get the police or the media's influence. And so if you're the highest bid, you pay all your money and you get like the bonus that goes along with it. If you're the lowest bid, you get negative of whatever it is, like respect, right? But if you're in the middle, you just lose half of your bid. And if you're the lowest, you lose that respect, but you keep all your money. So maybe you buy more troops later on. So that's the dynamic that you're dealing with. And as you're trying to get these victory points over certain conditions and certain quests and, you know, fighting and all of those aspects, right? If you have like negative five respect, I think what it is, or honor, I forget which, which attribute it is that will affect things. But like, if you're at that value, you can't win until you get to at least negative four. So like, you can't just totally tank a stat in that sense. But I mean, it's reasonable, I guess, for a plastified area control game price wise. And it's doing something different. I'm not surprised it's funded. It's just whether or not it's for you. And that is Omerta. Check it out. So now we're going to go over here. And this is Hunted Kobayashi Tower. I mean, this is Die Hard, the board game. Let's not kid ourselves, right? As much as Nemesis is Alien, the board game, this is Die Hard, the board game. I mean, the, the villain is literally named Lars, right? You're going up to the rooftop to stop Lars, who has captured your wife. And you're doing it over Christmas in the Kobayashi Tower, right? Right. So it's a solo game, though. And that's the big thing that you need to know. It's a solo push your luck card driven a little bit of die rolling with some mitigation. And they say one of the new things with this is more mitigation than the previous hunted series. Essentially, what you're doing is you're laying out these cards and you have to use these cards as they have iconography on them in order to activate other cards. So you have to discard a certain number of cards or a certain number of icons from cards that are out there in the display in order to activate other cards and how you choose to do so may allow you to move it may allow you to gather items it may allow you to travel to further places within the tower itself and you're going to have to go through enough places but these cards are also going to have bells on them and you are forced to go into fights with terrorists depending on if there are two terrorists out there or if there's one terrorist and two bells on the total amount of cards and you are forced to go do that and you only have a limited number of time counters that are going to be out there because you have these event cards that are going to be splayed out as you go and burn through time whether it's reloading fighting taking actions uh resting which allows you to kind of clear the board you know hiding if you will is what really what it is you have to lose time and as you lose more time i think you have 20 time total you slowly reveal every four time one of these event cards and if you get down to the bottom event card and you take the last one off well then you lose i mean time's up right and as the event cards go, then things are going to trigger and you're going to have to deal with that 19 locations, but you only go through 12 of them. And the bottom three are going to have special events or special things to go along with it because you like you take the bottom three and do something special with it in terms of the shuffling, you know, from that aspect, like several other games we've seen. And there are 19 total from that. So you're not using all of them. And again, just like with the event cards, you're only using, I believe, three, four of them each time, plus the game over card, which is always at the bottom. So I like the artwork. The theme is cool. I mean, it's Die Hard, folks. I mean, you don't like Die Hard and you're not a lover of Christmas. I don't know where I was going to go with that one. But again, essentially, like I said here, you're pulling out these cards. You use these cards with these icons on the sides in order to activate, right? Like these each have moves. This card down here on the left, the hallway requires two moves to activate it to go there. So then you do that or you do it vice versa. Here's the losing time to clear the row. You make too much noise with those bells though. Like I said, terrorist. Rulebook is there, previews are there. If you want some previews, if you want some solo stuff, this is your game this week as a whole. So yeah, I don't know, that's about it. That's all you need to know right now. And that's what we've got going on. Now we're going last up. We're going from game found. Well, we're going from Kickstarter to game found to backer kit. Because backer kit's got Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Did you know this was going to be a board game? I found out about it like a couple weeks ago. And I, there was no info on the board game page. But the designers were chirping in and giving some details. So it was kind of nice. But 
there was concern like is this an ip that's actually going to have a good mechanic or is it just going to be sort of uh skinning reskinning of something else and at 144,000, i'd say people like what they're seeing so far and you don't need to worry about the 48 hour thing because you don't care about the bling right the bling or the cling in this case so what you've got going on is you've got essentially a two to five player game where you're going to be utilizing these cards in a slightly different a slightly uh, familiar matter in more of almost like a pandemic-esque style but as a competitive game and what you're doing here is you get four actions on your turn and essentially so the three actions you're gonna take here are draw move and quest and what that means though in this cooperative game is you're just moving around doing quests and then eventually earning enough victory points in order to win you can have up to 12 cards in your hand and so as you're going around you're moving from place to place because these cards that you're going to be drawing are going to have uh not only numbers on them they're going to be utilizable in the next phase of things but they're going to have locations on them saying you need to quest in this particular area so you have to move from point a to point b to point c and this is your pandemic-esque right like you have four actions per turn so you get four opportunities to do this but how you divide those up is completely up to you in this competitive game because what happens is if you go to a quest say and there's a little gift down here you essentially have this quest that you play and then from that you have to use the rest of your cards not only to use the numbers that blackjack essentially is style of mechanism in this case in this example you can see that there's a 15 in the middle so you play cards to get closest but under 15 but you're going to have abilities on these individual cards whichever one's on the top essentially to mitigate or to affect the other people and this is the tricky point right like you play your cards and then everyone else gets cards from the deck and then a certain number i think it's like five and then they get to choose together which ones they play to try and stop you because they are trying to stop you from achieving the quest in order to for you to get the victory points and if they succeed, well, they just succeed. And if you succeed, well, then you get the victory points. And then there's also going to be certain cards that are going to happen or going to be along the way, like relics that are sort of Trump-ish cards that you may want to use if you battle someone else, if you're in the same location. And again, it's sort of more like a war mechanism than if in that case, where you essentially just take one card, flip it face down, and then flip it face up to see who has the higher card. But it's a little bit paper, scissors, rock as well from a war standpoint, because I think it's like one through fives are the numbers on these cards. And so based on that, it's, you know, obviously higher number wins but relics beat anything uh the shrubbery relic beats any relic but if you play a five a one actually beats a five makes sense so a little bit of trump situation going on there but a little bit paper scissor rock as well you're going to be fighting the black knight along the way and he's going to give you bonuses uh to potentially keep with you as you go along and then you can also as with the movie keeping thematically incorporated games uh afloat here you are doing catapulting cows because you can actually fire them to stop your opponents on their quests and that is probably the best thing about this game right now for me as a whole flicking freaking cows cow meeples are flying through the air if you've never seen this movie it's worth a see you either love it or hate it that's the game. Now, I like this because don't click on download the rulebook. Click on this link because if you click on this link, it brings you to the Google. But if you click on this link, it actually brings you to the rulebook. Sorry, I just had to show that off. Shipping is going to be great if you are in America. <laughs> Everywhere else, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's all I can say right now. So that's what it is. And there's going to be some extras, uh, but there's nothing out there yet at the time of me filming this. So we'll see what that is. I mean, flicking cows is just kind of cool. Now, whether or not the price point is right for you. And again, I hate this about backer kit, right? Like it doesn't even have it on the page. You have to click over here to get the pledge levels. So it's 50 bucks. I'm, it's not bad. It's not bad. Is it going to be better? It reminds me more of like Daybreak, CMYKs, where I felt like I was probably going to be able to get it less at retail if it went to retail. But if it didn't go to retail, you know, then you're going to miss out in a little bit. How do you feel about that? That's what I get the feeling of this. So that is Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Next up, five by five dice game, 14,000. It's got five hours to go. By the time you're watching, it's going to be done. It's a small indie game. It's $25. Um, you don't even need dice. Uh, you can use your own dice and they'll give you the print and play. But essentially what this is, is you've got actions and you've got objectives and you're going to be refilling up your hand of four and three of them. I think it's four actions and three objectives on a turn by turn basis. You can play objectives anytime on your turn, but essentially what you do is you draw a die, you roll a die essentially, and then you place the die on the board anywhere where it can go. And that's about it actions are going to be assorted to this and then the sum or the you know numerical or the color has to be wherever whatever however you need to be 
and you go until all of the board is full so all 25 spots happen and you're just gonna be playing back and forth but it'd be straightforward it's a nice little dice manipulation game and you're gonna be able to figure out it depending on how you want to use your action cards which are going to allow you to manipulate the dice and or the numbers or the colors and then you're going to have your objectives which are going to be just everything that you saw here with this gift going through the various portions of ones that could be so um 25 bucks it seems like a nice game i'm not sure i'd buy it you know knowing how many dice i have elsewhere that i could probably commandeer but Support your local indie publisher, right? There you go. Next up, we're talking about a reprint or another printing. Essentially, they sold out of the first print run of Votes for Women. And this is a two-player asymmetric head-to-head -head dueling in the style of like a Twilight Struggle, if you will. And they're, you know, killing it, actually. $75,000. I mean, the page is bare minimum, but they're going off of their pedigree. And they're not changing anything up. I don't really think there's anything else to do with this. It's just going to be $75. Whoosh. Uh, yeah, that's an indie game. You know, we got the splatter pricing going on here, but... I guess so. People seem to like it so far. I mean, it's got a card-driven gameplay where you're essentially going head-to-head, -head, drawing cards, and then bidding for strategy cards, and playing six cards on a round-by-round -round basis, uh, trying to either get 36 states to ratify or 13 states to reject. And if you don't have either by the end of the game, then you go to the final scoring. That's about all I'm going to say in a nutshell. People seem to like it, though, overall. They've got some videos here from the various big-name channels that you can pull from, and that's about all you need to know. Essentially, you can go over to Board Game Geek and get more info. I really wish they would have incorporated more of the mechanics on the actual page. Just like anything else, I don't care if it's successful. Show me why I'm getting it. Like, I don't necessarily want to go to Board Game Geek to find out some of this stuff sometimes. So, you know, it'd be nice from that aspect of things to have more on there, but, I mean, 75,000, 75,000. So, there you go. Next up, Scandinavian Big Box with Lancaster Big Box. Queen's just pulling out their inventory and saying, hey, do you want some of the stuff from previous? And just like always, I mean, they're funded. So, we're going to get $20,000 here by the time it ends at least. And they're going with two other big boxes. Scandinavian, uh, which is what? The Helsinki game, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. And the Copenhagen game. So, I have Copenhagen. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with Copenhagen. But I've always felt like Helsinki was a better version of it. Because you've got sort of the whole different uh, polyomino situation going on there. As opposed to the Tetris type situation as a whole. So I just felt it like it was a step up. I actually have most of this stuff over here. And I just haven't played it in a long time. And the expansion stuff here, it just gives a lot more varied content. If you look at the distribution of some of these colors on the polyominoes in the first place. Otherwise, essentially what you've got going on is you've got like a card display in the center. And you're drafting from the card display. And then the card display rotates, at least in Copenhagen. I'm not sure if it varies a little bit in Helsinki. But like if you draw from a certain spot, then they all get shifted over. And so with Helsinki, I think again, it just slightly varies that up. As you can see, it's more of an octagonal display there. As opposed to like a little bit of one side there. And that's about it. Do you want the big box of both of them? Again, I would argue that you probably don't need both of them. You're probably going to choose one and like one better than the other. Lancaster, I don't really know anything about Lancaster, to be frank with you guys. Uh, they're giving you your Marrakesh add-on with their more recent crowdfunding campaign of the Marrakesh expansion as well. So you can check it out. But if you really want a copy of Finish Line, they're going to throw it in for free. I'm just going to leave it at that. Lancaster, again, you guys can let me know how you feel about Lancaster in the comment section. They're throwing in some Killingham Builder there at the end as well with one of the big box uh, Empire editions there. So that's about it. What is this actually costing though? I didn't see that. $100 for both of those games. Okay. Thousand print run and you've got 26 people. Okay. That's not a lot. And it looks like you can even get Shogun and Alhambra. So they're basically offering their whole category and catalog here. So it's not even really new stuff it's just kind of a little bit of new stuff and most of their inventory so i guess so from a business standpoint so there you go i'm just going to leave it as simple and as straightforward as that there you go next up another make 100 game this is a nice little trick taking game folks uh if you're not familiar at all with this you should check this one out um it is just funded at three thousand dollars and this is a dual game essentially 18 cards trick taking duality and it's got a little bit of a scout ish combination with trick taking if you will uh, not because I don't think of like Scout as a normal trick taker. Scout's not really a trick taker as a whole. But if Scout was a trick taker, this is what I imagine it would look like. Because essentially, what you've got here is four different suits that are, you know, essentially uh, one on one end and one on the other. And you can not only have them flipped over to basically change the whole dynamic of what's going to be going on, but you can also flip your hand around as you can do in Scout to change what's available to you in the first place. And how you do that is over a trick by trick basis, you play your cards. You have to follow suit as normal trick layers. But the difference here is that if you do not have suit to follow, you can play anything else. And then it's determined by how many stars are actually on the card. 
stars may just be one or two and it may not correspond to the number that is actually there and then you get to potentially score points off of that now the tricky part is if you are the person that does not win the trick you get to choose somebody to flip their hand completely over and to be clear that includes yourself if you don't like your hand as a whole that's it that's all it's getting right there scoring over here is a little bit different when all the cards have been played you get your winnings you win the last round you earn the cube the player with the most cards one earns the coin then a star for each number five one and then when all five coins have been won tally up the scores so a little bit different there as a total and that'd be my concern is can you keep track of this while you're playing the suits the suits winning is going to be the easy but the dynamic is going to be a lot more complicated and i think it's based off of this not the actual card play in and of itself which is kind of cute and clever in that aspect of things so yeah, you want a travel version of it, you want an international version of it, you want some of the add-ons from their previous makes. I have no clue. I don't even know any of these. I don't remember covering any of these in the past. So check those out if you will. And that's about it from um, Zerua Games. Let's see. How many are actually available? Can you just get how many ever? I don't actually know what make 100 means anymore because it used to be literally just like 100. But now that's clearly not the case because 122 backers. Then last up this week, we'll talk about Arctic Ignited, another two to four player card driven game, another small indie game that's funded. It's at $1,600 uh, ready at this point. It's going to take 30 minutes to play as this head to head uh, strategic dominance of frozen tundra so if we go over to the rulebook page really quickly here the explanations on the actual page itself are not as crystal clear thankfully i mean the rulebook is literally one page here and so essentially what it says is you're constructing the order deck you're selecting the doctrine of one of three for all of these games uh basically to add it to your order deck to become part of your six card lineup that's essentially going to be available to you you're laying out your um offensive and defensive capabilities with your units and then you're doing your reinforcement deck which includes other units that are going to be available to you uh, you have up to three additional cards that can be added in addition to that and you're going to be slowly taking your actions on a turn by turn basis with the programming i think of up to three per turn and it allows you to not only manipulate the cards but also order the cards in the sequence that you want as you're moving them across attacking them and then trying to take over your opponent's base but this is a lot of text. It's a wall of text. I won't read it to you, but that's what you need to know essentially. And that's why you're going to be looking at it. So it's a small indie publisher. It is only, what did I say, 12 euros right now at this point. And if you're interested in it, you can even get a four player edition, which is going to cost you 20. So if you're really interested in this one, go read the rules for yourself and try and get a sense of it. A little bit more obtuse than I was expecting, but you know what? This has the appeal, especially from the wargaming card manipulation side of things. So check it out. So there you go. That is the roundup this week and new this year, new this year. You know, I always speculate at the end of the year. How many episodes of this have I done? Uh, how many games do I cover? You know, am I covering more games than other people? Does it really matter? No, but I'm kind of just curious, right? Like, so I'm gonna keep track every week, how many games I'm covering and I'm gonna do a running tally. I didn't even do it for this video yet, so uh, it'll probably be in the comment section or flashing over me right now. So we'll kind of see where that goes and how you feel. And next week is actually probably the first big week of the year because there's a bunch of stuff launching. And so next week's will be much more spectacular fireworks included. So we'll see what Conan as well as Spire's End have in store for us along with uh, the reprint for Among Cultists. And hopefully I will have my video out between now and then for Among Cultists. So stay tuned for that. I may or may not be combining it with another super popular social deduction-esque game. Maybe, maybe not. I haven't decided yet. So we'll figure that out after I finish this one. That's all I got. Stay classy. Have a great freaking day. Um, you know what? I may or may not also do a video. You may or may not see a video from me very shortly coming out of my top 10 things I watched from this past year too. Not that anyone's going to watch that video, but you know what? I watched a lot of stuff video wise, movie wise, show wise, and just let you know, it's going to be some subtitled stuff that you've never heard of, but there's some great stuff out there. If you've never watched subtitled stuff, a lot better than some of the American or North American trash that I see elsewhere as well. But there is some good American and North American stuff too, so don't discount that. But globally, great stuff. Anyway, I'm done rambling about TVs and movies shows at the end here. Have a great day. Stay classy. Hopefully your kids didn't have three snow days this week like mine did. Just got back from two weeks of vacation and three days of snow days. Like, I'm filming this Thursday night, finishing this up here. They've already canceled school for Friday because there's a big storm coming in sometime in the middle of the day tomorrow. And which is which is a problem because you can't bus kids home in the middle of the day and something like that. So I understand. At the same time, the last time that this happened, it kind of poofed out and didn't really do what they said it was going to do. So we'll see. Anyway, I'm off though. So I'm going to be cooped up in the house with all three of them. 
Hopefully, though, they'll just be playing outside in the snow the whole day. Ha ha! Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Have a great freaking day. Love you guys. Over 9,000! Couldn't help myself. Peace out.